Hey everyone, how's it going? So welcome to episode four of Reel Up My Ride. And if you're finding me for the first time or if you're coming back, then you're all absolutely very welcome here. So thank you so much for all of your likes, your comments, your subscriptions, your stuff like that. It really, really does mean the world. Um, and if you're not familiar with this entire series, then I take all of your blueprints your, of your rides, your areas, your coasters and everything that you submit to me. And then using my experience of working for a theme park company and also my Planet Coaster Playtime, I inject some realism into your creations. So if you want to submit your project or your park or whatever then I'll put details on how to do that in the description below but without further ado should we check out today's project so we're going to do something slightly different for this episode in previous episodes you've submitted your work to me we've then had a chat about what you want from the project and then I've added the realism around that existing piece of work and when I'm doing that I like to stay loyal to your original design because you've designed things with purpose so that ride is a certain layout it's a certain size it's a certain position all for a reason but then I would also like to do an episode where I can talk about the realism of coasters so things like their operations their transitions their layout their speed their maintenance that sort of thing so what better way of doing that than to use a piece of my own work that I can have absolutely zero loyalty to and this is the park that I'm going to be using it's my old alpha park I did this from the day that the alpha was re released right up to the point that 1.0 was was out and um, the park's now broken it's I would need to do quite a lot of work to actually make it playable uh, I've done a full park tour in a separate video and um, that's already available on my channel so I'll, I'll pull a link somewhere to that if you want to go and have a bit of a throwback feeling um, especially if you're wanting to know about some of the decisions and see some of the bad decisions that I made al along the way um, but nestled in amongst all of this chaos uh, is this lovely little B&M sitting here uh, and it's a, it's a B&M that would typically who would have been built right at the start of the boom so we're talking the late 90s early 2000s it has all of the hallmarks of a traditional B&M and the layout is very typical in the vertical loop, the zero G, the Immelman. Um, and so it's very much taking cues from Cumber at Bush Gardens. I know that's not a flawless, it's a, a normal sit down, but they would have been sort of like the influences back then, right? Um, but we're also probably going to be taking key, uh, cues from Kraken at SeaWorld and Hydra at Dorney Park and everything. Um, and so this is this is the coaster itself. I mean, I never I never even changed the colour of the coaster. It's just the default orange that the that the flawless coasters come in. But in terms of a B and M layout, it's a relatively solid layout. Um, it would just need a few tweaks just to to bring it to life a little bit more. Um, and there's a few of the transitions that are a bit dodged, like this bend down here needs some work. This uh, drop here needs some work this Immelman is probably the wrong shape and there's absolutely no heartline rolling in this at all um, and the speed and the and the pacing of it would probably need some work as well but as a, as a solid layout like for a first coaster that I ever built it's it's all right it does what it needs to do um, it's a very generic theme so back in the days of the alpha there were some youtubers out there you know who they are um, that were doing some beautiful things with the pieces by using them in ways that nobody ever thought you should use the building pieces and um, would spend hours doing these absolutely amazing creations that i could never ever compete with so i was just going for believable realism with what we had at the time so the park is believable as a park um, you could sort of squint and and you could imagine that you were in a real park um, there was no sort of like trickery detail that was going on here and remember as well back in the alpha we were very limited with the pieces that we had so um, because we were trying the game out we were testing it and we were putting it through its paces ready for the full release so um, you won't see any of the DLCs you won't see any of the 1.0 pieces or anything like that in here um, I mean some of the pieces have even swapped out so I think over here we've got the what's now the rough concrete it used to be a panel piece um, so that's now swapped out check textures and stuff it goes to show you how old the park is and so this is the this is the work i'd like to do um or this is the ride i'd like to reel up um, it needs a maintenance area it needs its transitions sorting it needs its layout and pacing dealing with um the area itself needs to have some piece of work on it i mean we've got a restaurant in the middle here but we need to do some work with that restaurant um the ride that's sitting within the central area here probably wouldn't be here now i know what i know about designing parks so i might i might move it or i might take it out of the area completely um rework the queue and uh, rework the, the shop area and everything so that's that's my plan anyway um 
So I will see you in the first update. Here we go. So how is this for a complete coaster teardown then? So I've just spent the last day or so literally tearing the coaster apart, reprofiling the track. I've, done, I've given it a completely new layout, a new design, and I've also deliberately added some elements as well that I can talk about. So you may you may find that this might not necessarily be completely representative of a B&M layout, um, but it sort of gives that that idea, and I've deliberately added things in to be able to to be able to talk about them. But this does now start to feel like a typical late 90s, early 2000s B&M sit-down coaster, whether it's flawless or whether it's a, a normal a normal sit-down train. So let's have a look at the, the actual coaster, shall we? Let's go for a tour. So the station itself, not much has changed. I've just removed all of the theming. Um, I've changed the angle as well of where it sits on the on the landscape because I want my maintenance area to be in this in this area here. I need to find a way of making it work with the landscape and the terrain and everything so that it's real. Because at the moment it's gonna it's gonna hang off the side of a uh, side of a cliff. So I just need to work out how that's going to be. And then you've got your entrance and exit on opposite sides of the station. That's pretty typical of, of theme parks. And then our lift hill here. I've just reprofiled the lift hill, so the original coaster was 40 degrees, um, and I've just reduced that to 30. So it goes to the same height; it just takes longer to to get there. Um, and so a coaster, a B&M coaster that would have been built around the late 90s, early 2000s, would probably have had a 30 degree lift hill. That's quite typical. That's quite common. Um, and newer B&Ms can get, you know, 40, 45 degrees, depending on the height and the, and the profile, but typically older ones would be 30. And the idea of this coaster is it's supposed to be a modest coaster. It's not supposed to be, you know, a, a jaw drop or anything. It's just supposed to be there because it was one of the first major coasters that the park would have added at the time. So it then comes into a, a drop of about 60 degrees. Again, it's nothing to write home about. It's probably a bit too steep, um, but it's just enough to get a bit of speed up. I've then just used the in-game vertical loop. This is very this this sort of transition um, between elements is pretty typical of a of a B and M. You go into a loop, zero G Immelman kind of effect. Um, and I'd say I just use the in-game vertical loop. It's perfectly fine for what you're looking to achieve. But what I've done is I've reprofiled this exit, so it's not so it's not so harsh. And then into the zero G roll, I've reprofiled that. It's the same height, but I've just added the uh, heartline rolling to it. So we were talking about this in episode one, and um, how you can tell that you've got a good heartline roll because of the there's two there's two things. Um, the ribbon effect, where it looks like it's a it's a ribbon on a shirt, um, where it sort of comes up, you know, like the eight day ribbons for example, comes up, spins round, and goes back down. Um, and then the other one is that it feels like the back of the train is sliding out. That's how you know that you've got a relatively good heartline rolling. And then we come to Immelmans. Now Immelmans are an absolute nightmare to design. I hate doing them um, because they're, they're, they're a very specific, unique shape. And I get asked all the time, well, what's the difference between an Immelman and a Sidewinder? So you find that Sidewinders tend to be used on coasters like Vekoma um, and they are very similar. And the answer is there's not much difference and when I've done all of my research and when I've done all of the, the stuff that I do at work and everything, um, I tend to find one major difference between the two. And this is how I can normally tell the difference between the two. So an Immelman will usually roll from zero degrees to 180 and then it goes back down to zero through uh, the roll and it doesn't actually completely roll over. So unlike the zero G roll here where you've got a complete 360 roll, an Immelman doesn't do that. It goes up to a point of 180 and then it goes back through the same degrees that it went through to get to 180 to get back down to the end. And then they also leave on the opposite side um, in the opposite direction that they enter as well with just a slight degree variation, typically somewhere between 11 degrees and 30 degrees depending on the design. There is no right or wrong answer when it comes to a, an Immelman. Whereas a Sidewinder is the opposite. You'll tend to find that it will follow the same or similar pattern, but it will do a complete roll. So it goes right up to the top, it rolls all the way round 360 as it comes down the other side. Um, but also what you find with Sidewinder is rather than coming out at around about a 30 degree angle, they tend to come off at a 90 degree angle. So um, you tend to find that it would sort of leave perpendicular to how it was. Um, and so Immelmans as well, especially for B&Ms, they're quite a difficult design to do. So for this particular one, what I did was I snapped the track to 11.25 degrees. Um, and because this is quite a small, a small one, you, it's a bit difficult to scale. So I snap it to 11.25 degrees. I then snap the track up to four meters. 
and it goes up two notches, up two notches, up two notches until you get to 90 degrees. And then from there, you do three notches. So the idea is that you're bringing your train in at a certain speed down here. So you're using quite a, a shallow angle of uh, ascent so that you're absorbing as many of those Gs as you possibly can. But then as the train starts to slow down over the top, you can then make your angles much steeper. And so um, I tend to do from the 90 degree point, then three snaps to the point where you get to minus 11.25. So it's coming back down again. But then at that point, so the minus 11.25, you then start the turn. So you're, um, you're rolling it round using the, the heartline rolling. Again, it's going out facing the same way that it was going in. So look, it's this it doesn't completely roll. Um, and then you do the, the turn as it's heartline rolling so that you then end up with this like diagonal, diagonal effect. This isn't the perfect Immelman, by the way. This is by far not perfect because of the scaling. It's quite difficult to get the, the scaling of it of it right. Um, but interestingly, when you're doing a reverse Immelman, you do roll it. So like this one here, it does roll over. So technically this is a reverse side by sidewinder, but you would consider it to be an Immelman because it's doing the same maneuver. It goes in, uh, inverts to 180 degrees, comes out at around about a 30 degree difference, but still the opposite direction to the way that it came in. So Immelmans are an absolute nightmare to nightmare to do um, right. But when you, when you profile correctly, then they're good. And then when you come out of the Immelman, you tend to not go in as steep as you did. So your, your, your temptation is to come out of this at 45 degrees or steeper and you end up with almost like a, um, a vertical loop. But actually you want to be coming out around about 30 to 35 degrees. Um, if you look at B and M Immelmans, they, they, don't, they, don't enter, they don't leave steeply. They always leave at a quite shallow, quite shallow angle. And then we've got just a corkscrew, um, nothing special. Again, it's the in-game corkscrew. In hindsight, I think I probably should have done a custom corkscrew here just to, just to continue the rolling. Um, and what I like to do is vary up the continuous roll. So if I'm rolling to the clockwise here, I'll roll anti-clockwise to the next one and then vice versa. So if I'm doing this one's coming out to anti-clockwise and the next roll would be clockwise because it just continues that, that swoop effect that you get. And then you've just got this uh, these bends as well. So b &Ms tend to use quite snappy bends. Um, they tend to come up to a point, they level off, and then they do the bend. So they bring you almost like twist you in, they bring you up and twist you into a position. Then they level out the track and then they turn you, but it's all in one swoop. Um, and then the reverse coming out is also true, but you tend to unlevel, like you, you end up back at zero degrees a lot quicker coming out than you do going in because you haven't got as much speed coming through it. So you tend to find snappy, snappy turns and again this isn't the perfect turn because this is a scaled down coaster i like this one as well so i've taken these cues from hair razor at ocean world um because that's typically how the bends on ocean on hair razor is uh, profiled or are profiled then we go into a corkscrew and then i like to fill out the 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 end of my BNMs with bunny hop moments airtime moments because it just gives you a little bit of space to breathe you've got quite a lot of coaster going on in this area um, so you just do a real quick bunny hop into a turnaround and then into the reverse Immelman to take you back in the opposite direction so that you're not then having to find a way of clustering through all of this. Like I could have brought the track round underneath the corkscrew and around this way or underneath the corkscrew and through this way. But no, I just thought I wanted to turn it round. So it goes into a, into a reverse Immelman, second bunny hop, a wave turn as we would know it from um, RMCs and then into the final break run and so when you're designing all of your um, inversions you want to be looking at having them hitting the train hitting these inversions at a constant speed or at the same speed for the inversions so that means that your inversions are going to be getting smaller and smaller as your train starts to lose momentum um, through the track so like this corkscrew for example is way bigger than this one at the background that it's going through now I think we're about to auto save um, so you'll find that yeah, you've got a complete difference. And then the Immelman that you've got on the right hand side here is very, very, very much smaller than this Immelman here. But when you do the analysis of your uh, forces, so if I just bring this back up, you'll see that they're actually, uh, so do heat maps for uh, vertical Gs. 
uh, let's be live data, previous data. So you'll see that the G forces are actually around about the same for each of the um, for each of the elements that it's going through, but the elements just get smaller and smaller as you as you go through the actual coaster layout. Um, and so that's what you want to be trying to aiming for when you, when you're dealing with speed. And then with your transitions, like I say, you really want to make them as smooth as you possibly can. So as I've alluded to earlier, continue your rolls. So like here, for example, I wish I would have, because it, it's here as well. Um, this corkscrew should be a custom corkscrew because this would roll round uh, anti-clockwise and then it should be going into a, a, a second anti-clockwise corkscrew, but into then a clockwise bend. So you'd want to continue that roll. Um, I mean, the game does it fine here. It copes with it quite well, but yeah. Um, and I've done that here as well. So I've made sure that this zero G roll is in the opposite direction to the moment. Um, and it just gives a bit of variation. It stops your riders from getting dizzy. So if you think of the likes of the Smiler at Alton Towers, which obviously I know is not a B&M, that tends to use that quite well in the sense that you've got a certain number of inversions clockwise and a certain number anti-clockwise, and it's a way of making the ride more comfortable for your riders. And likewise with your uh, with your bends as well, you want them to swoop as much as you can. Um, you want to imagine that it's a bird flying when you're going around bends rather than having them really stark. So, and the idea of banking your track as well is so that you're transferring all of your lateral G's to positive or negative G's because that's more comfortable. The, the human body can um, cope with much more that way than, it, than any of the other G-forces. So rather than having laterals where you pushed out the side of the train, you wanted to convert that wherever you can into positive or negative G's. And by doing you, the way you do that is to bank your track as steeply as you possibly can. And so you need to just assess the speed that your trains are going into your uh, into your bends just to make sure that you're doing that effectively. So if you can see this one, it, it bangs quite heavily. Um, and then it's a bit snappy around the uh, around the bend once it's leveled off. Likewise with this one, it swoops. Uh, but then this one is slightly different again. Um, it's not so banked, but it's just as snappy. And then this last one, because we've now lost quite a lot of momentum, is a bit of an airtime, an airtime thing. Um, so it comes through and then swoops into a, an airtime hill down. Um, but you don't need to have this as banked because it doesn't hit it as fast. But it will still pull a similar number of Gs as these two because you've profiled them correctly. And so that's pretty much how I've torn the coaster apart and started again. I know this was a really big, chunky update, um, but I just wanted to talk through all of my design, design decisions and all of the things that I use in terms of principles and the things that I found out from talking to those people that do design coasters. But like I say, I'm absolutely not a coaster designer in any way, shape or form. So I, I can only go by the physics that I know and not the physics that I'm classically trained to do. And there is no right or wrong answer when it comes to designing a roller coaster. So please remember that. So just because I've used these techniques and these things to build a B&M, it doesn't make me any more right than anybody else. Um, all I'm doing is I'm just using all of the angles that I've managed to research and all of the speeds and all of the distances and the heights and things using coasters that are in our portfolio um but that doesn't make it any right any more right or wrong um so please remember that when you're designing your own coasters so just because i've gone through this idea of realism on a layout doesn't make me any more right than or any more correct than any, anybody else but anyway i'm going to carry on doing the area because i need to reprofile all, all of these paths i need to find a new home for the ride and the restaurant and i need to do some work around here as well so i'm going to go off and do that and the next up in the next update we're going to start talking about operation so how do roller coasters actually operate what's expected of the ride ops and everything so anyway let's let's get down to it okay so we're a couple of hours later and i started to now kit out the station with all of the kit that we're going to need to talk through the the operation of the roller coaster you know how it all comes together in in real life so let me just real quickly show you around what i've done so far um i've just gone around and started to delete some of the scenery that's not needed uh for this build and then i've also started to just replace all of the the paving as well so it's now in a position where i think it's as good as it's going to get um i've also just had to reprofile this last bend as well when i was doing the station i realized that i didn't have enough space on the brake run here to have the full length of the train on the uh transfer track so i've just had to extend that out and then bring the the pathing out again and this path now matches and, and comes up to the screaming swing so i just need to do the touching up work 
all along here and everything. Um, and I started to, to plan, guess what this is going to be? Uh, yeah, it's going to be the ride photo booth. Um, typical, it's just your typical standard ride photo booth that I create. So as you can see, it takes on the same form as all of, all of the others. It just needs kitting out and decorating. And then because this is an alpha park and because it's very broken, this is an interesting piece. Um, this, this is actually unusable, this, this area, uh, because here used to be two stalls. And those stalls don't exist in the game anymore, but the game still thinks they do. It's still reserved. So I can't actually do anything with this area. So I sort of just have to decorate it with something. Um, it's going to be the burger restaurant, I think. And then I've just started to do this as well. Um, and I think it's, there's a roller coaster called Insane Speed. Um, I, think, I think it's Taiwan. Uh, I've just literally lifted this idea from... Um, Oh, it's un it's unshamefully stolen from that uh, but I just wanted like a bit of a cool entrance plaza um, and then I started to think about the monetization options of the area as well in the sense we're gonna have ride photos here we're gonna have some kind of food outlet here so I thought it would make sense to have some kind of games this is gonna be quite a busy area right so you're probably gonna end up with some kind of monetization option here and this is all you can really put in here you wouldn't want big game stores or anything you just put a couple of machines in and it does its thing anyway Let's talk roller coaster operations. So here's the station work that I've been doing so far. Um, and I started to pull all, all of this together based on my, my knowledge of how the roller coasters that I interact with work and also a load of research from other parks from all around the world. So what I've then done is I've taken all of that information and collated it into a very generic global operation standard so it what i'm going to say now is going to vary very much between country to country um and obviously manufacturer to manufacturer and there's going to be variations all around everything that i say so don't take anything for gospel and don't don't think that a park is doing it wrong if you visit a park with the information that i've got and think that they're doing it differently because they might not be companies do it differently countries do it differently ride manufacturers do it differently so just have that in mind when when we talk when we're talking about this so station setup then um this is what this is what i've done so far you've got a, a essentially what you've got is two teams um or it might be one team but there's going to be two roles within that team you're going to have somebody that's solely responsible for the operation and the deploying of the ride and then you've got somebody that's solely responsible for the um checking of the restraints and the safety of, of the guests and these will probably rotate they'll also they may also have other roles as well you may find them at the entrance they might you may find them at merge points you may find them right at the ride entrance in the shop whatever um baggage handling that sort of stuff they could be anywhere um and so these these people here our hosts let's call them um they would be allocated to an area of the station so they would not be allowed to cross over the station without the permission of the ride up um and they would be responsible for a certain number of rows along the along the coaster and I, i've just split this up into four but you could be responsible for one entire side um per person you could have more people might be split it into three again it depends on the park it depends on the regulation and the legislation in the country that you're operating um, and so what what would happen is all of your guests would board and then these people would then be responsible for a certain number of seats a certain number of rows and they would go along they would check the restraints on the rows they're responsible for but only within arm's reach so this person for example in this in this particular setup would not be responsible for these rows here uh, down this side uh, because this lady would be so this guy would come along and check the first i think it's 10 rows i've got in here so it'd be the first five rows the put the guy at the back would be responsible for the back five this lady would be responsible for the back five and this lady is responsible for the front five they then do all of the necessary checks so there's a few things again depends on the country you're in as to what gets checked as part of this um can't comment on that for the, the entire world but they would do their necessary checks and then they would return back to this point here uh, or back to their points and then depending on the type of roller coaster you would then either have a physical area that that person has to stand in which is marked out and they they're not to move that move away from that point when the ride is in motion or if it's a, a train that's being launched out of the station at speed for example they may they may stand behind a physical barrier um, and then that barrier will not open until it's safe to do so. So that person is physically cannot be hit by that train. Uh, again, it depends on your health and safety of, of your country. Um, and so what would then happen is once they've once they've 
done all of their checks and they've done their visual inspections and made sure that all is all is as it should be people aren't holding cameras and all of that sort of stuff they'll then push a button that's that's here um and then that sends a signal to the operator to say yes that 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 area that those five rows that that one person is responsible is clear and there's a timeout on that button and that timeout can be anywhere between maybe 10 seconds and two minutes again depending on rides um and then once you've got the all f four all clears the the ride operator themselves will then do their final checks for the ride and again they vary between manufacturer park location in the world etc but they'll do their final checks of the of the ride and then once they've got the all clear from all four they can click they can press the launch option and then the train is sent and then the train comes back into the come back into the station from the one behind and if any one of these times out um so if for example this guy is ready way before this lady at the back because she's got to deal with a struggling guest or uh, somebody that might need assistance then uh, they may order all of the buttons to be rechecked and then repressed um and then so these people would then sort of have that have that moment just to reinspect their train do the, all the visual checks they may not necessarily do need to do the restraints again but they just need to recheck all of their um area again and then repress the button and and, and off it off it goes uh, and so within the actual console itself uh, planet coaster have done an amazing job of the actual console so you've got i'm not going to go through the details because this varies way too much between manufacturers and the type of ride and everything but you essentially just have a control panel with everything that you need in there um, and the big green button to actually send the train you'd have some kind of cctv in the background and that would then have visual sight of the track layout and the queue line and the, the emergency exits and the station itself and so on and so forth and then you'd have some kind of power display that's a uh, power source power cabinet in there for them to come in and check um, and then you would just then find a way of making this uh, inaccessible to anybody that's coming in so you'd have your appropriate signage staff only etc etc and remember these these guys here they would need permission to leave the area in this that they're responsible for so that's either the ride up calling them or them requesting it by using hand signals um, and again that varies between park and everything but typically those these people would always be tied to the area that they're that they're working in and so within the station itself, I've just put some emergency lighting, some emergency signs on and some clear signage to say that the exit is this side. Um, I've also just put a power cabinet down the back here because that would sort of start to feed into the maintenance area. So you would have a, a bit of a station, a station bit. You've got your emergency signing, your danger of death signing, signage. And then you've also got your um, baggage bays here as well. So this is where you'd put your your loose articles and whatever to make it in. I don't have any loose article signs and I can't find any on the workshop either. It's TMTK. So um, well, I might just have, I might have to leave those out, but you would have some kind of baggage signing, signage. Mm -hmm. And then here in the UK, we would have um, any enclosed area, you would have a no smoking sign. So I've just included that. It's good practice anyway, right? You wouldn't want that in any kind of any kind of way. And then just a reminder of the um, ride restrictions. You'd find this at the entrance point as well, but this is just a reminder to say that actually if you're entering the stage and you're agreeing to these terms, you tend to find this in more um, litigious societies than you would trusting societies. Like, for example, I'd probably see it in America, but I may not see it in Italy, say. Um, you'd see these at definitely at the, the, the front entrance but maybe not necessarily as you're entering the station um i don't know by the way i just made those two countries up um so and yeah so that's that's pretty much how i've how i've set out the station and how i've set the station up um and i just wanted to talk through a bit of like real loose knowledge or loose understanding of, of how the how the rides work but as i said before i keep i can't i can't say it enough it varies by park it varies by country it varies by operator and it varies by manufacturer as well so what i've given you there is a real overview of what to expect and you'll, you'll notice it when you go to the go to your own parks now and, and see that so anyway i'm going to carry on uh carry on with this bit that it's going to be the maintenance area next and we'll talk about how the uh the rides are maintained 
annual maintenance and everything and I'll carry on decorating so I'll see you in the next update. Alright then so we're heading towards the Homewood Run and I think it's time that we talk about maintenance uh, but before we do that let me just show you what, what's changed since the last update so um, for those that haven't seen the Kyle Well Wonderland walkthrough video that I do I talk about this restaurant that I include in all of my pieces of work from a certain park onwards um, called Berg's and it's essentially it's, it's designed to be exactly the same in each park or almost imagine like it's a franchise who is insistent that the look and feel for every single outlet that you ever have is exactly the same regardless to where you are so um, we've got a couple of chains in the UK that, that, that do that sort of American Italian diners that sort of thing um, and so that's what I do in these parks and I do that for a couple of reasons really the, the primary reason is when you're stuck for inspiration for an area always fall back on a piece of building or a piece of work that you've done that feels familiar because it, it sort of it unblocks that creator's block that you get um, and I've, I've only done this in here because this restaurant that I've now deleted that was here originally was the original blueprint of this entire idea so I wanted to pay a bit of homage to, to this by adding it in but because this part of the park is not playable because of the error um, that we've got I can't really do much else with this to reel it up like I can't actually make it functional as a stall and we're not going to have guests in this park anyway because there's no park entrances and I can't edit them to put edit the park to put them in so we're a bit tied to what we can do but just inside here all, all I've done is this rustic look and feel of a burger bar so the idea is that it's supposed to be this open exposed brick very red very open wooden sort of effect I've not bothered to do much detailing in here because this isn't the star of this show so there's no sauce outlets there's no serviette dispensers there's no stuff clutter and, and whatever lying around um, I'll when I do the final detailing, I'll do bins and, and, and whatever, so you'll find those in here. But like I say, this, this area is not even playable, so there's no point wasting too much time on it. I just wanted to get that that homage in to say, yes, I'm, I'm including the updated version of the original bl blueprint that's, that's in here. Um, I've also just bricked off all of this plaza area. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know how far out I'm going to go yet. Um, and I might even change the colour. I think it just sort of drags the the area down a little bit but it's just there as a placement and I've started to put all of the curbs in as well and start to think about safety so I've put the path covers where the uh, the ride comes quite close to the path, path system itself and uh, I've also started to fence off the outside of the ride as well and because of the the placement of the original paths we're a bit tied to what we can do um, so like this fence for example is going to have to be flushed to the path so I need to find a way of, of decorating it and filling in this space and everything so that's that's all part of the detailing phase that happens next but the main part of the work has happened over here in the maintenance area in the maintenance shed so when you when you're dealing with roller coasters they're always going to need some sort of maintenance and, and depending on where you are in the world what park you work for um, what local legislation you may have depends on how often this maintenance happens and so typically what you'll tend to find is that in the morning there will be some kind of an inspection of the ride and how that looks again depends on legislation and local requirements that might be ranging from a physical inspection of every single piece of track early in the morning before you send the first train and then late at night after you send the last train um, or it might just be a visual inspection it might be just to make sure that there's nothing obvious that's wrong it could be physical checking of everything like I say it depends on on where you are um, and then you'll have some kind of like train checks as well that, that go on so they'll go around the actual physical train make sure that there's no loose bolts make sure that everything's tightened up that the train is fit for purpose it could be serviced and so on and so forth um, and what you'll then tend to find is the engineers in the morning will hand it to the ride staff in the uh, in the morning ready for the actual operation and then the ride staff hand it back to the engineers at the end and they do their checkout checks um, and like I say that is typical with with how you would operate a, a ride and then you would have this service maintenance area so this service maintenance area is where all of your checks and everything would happen it's where all of your repairs would happen and as a park you need to make a decision on whether you're going to have all of your checks done beside the ride or whether you're going to have one massive central area where things can happen so like you might have off the side of the park you might have a massive service area where everything everything goes and what tends to happen is on a frequent basis and again depending on where you are in the world on a frequent basis you'll then 
um, dismantle all of the trains right down to each individual component and you'll lay them out on the floor and so you'll have a, a line of bolts you'll have a line of wheels you have a line of restraint you'll have a line of whatever chassis and bits of metal and whatever and for some countries for insurance purposes an independent inspector then needs to come out and check those items those those bits of kit um, and then they sign it off as being compliant they sign it off as being safe um, and then you, you get insured and you put the train back together and then you put it back on the track and off you go and so again you, the park needs to decide where that's going to happen is it going to happen beside the ride is there enough space to put it beside the ride so that they can just do it or if you've got a, a bigger portfolio of coasters you might consider just having them in one central area and everything gets trucked back but that's going to affect then how you design this area so if if in this instance we're saying that this is on the side of the hill you might not have enough room to do all of those things here so you're going to need space and you're going to need the ability for all of these lorries to come into the side pick up all of the pieces and then drive them off to a, um, a central like maintenance area and then drive them back and have a have the facilities and ability to then construct them and reconstruct them or deconstruct them and reconstruct them should i say uh, beside the ride so that's going to affect what you need here so you're going to need things like cranes you're going to need things like ropes you're going to need things like toolboxes and power supplies and whatever whereas if you're going to do everything beside the uh, beside the the actual track itself or beside the ride then you're going to need a much bigger maintenance area so you're going to need space to store all of the trains you're going to need space to have the lorries you're going to need space to um, line everything up and and make sure that everything is is there you're going to need space for the equipment so what how you decide to to manage your maintenance will determine the size that you need beside the uh, side here now typically you don't need to have a warehouse that's big enough to host host both both trains because typically you'd have one in the station and you'd have one in the maintenance bay or you would have one on the transfer track in the maintenance bay if you're if you're doing any kind of any kind of work and sometimes within these maintenance bays you might then line them up side by side so you might have a bit of a transfer track in here you have one uh, central transfer track that can do one at a time and then it splits inside into two or three or however many trains you've got and so that's just a bit of an insight on how maintenance areas work and it's kind of fascinating when you get behind the scenes and you start to see these elements of these trains that you you always see operating on a track just stripped down to their absolute individual components and all lined up and then they get reconstructed again at the end of their maintenance period so um but yeah that's one thing that i sort of that i've learned going around is is about the size of the maintenance areas actually is not always proportional to the size of the ride that he's dealing with and it depends on the, the other facilities you're offering in the park so that a park of this size for example would probably take the opportunity to have a much bigger maintenance area because you've got all of these coasters that are going to need servicing probably out out of season in this instance and so they would deconstruct them all ship them all off to one central area have them all inspected, maintained, signed off, and then ship them back and reconstruct them again. So you would need smaller areas. Um, it's the autosave again. So you're going to need smaller areas to um, run around the side of the side of the rides, and then you just have some some kind of uh, access, vehicular access. So I'm going to carry on anyway, detailing this, uh, detailing this, and finishing it off. We're in the final run now, so uh, the next one that we do should be the before and after. So here we go. All right, so it's time to welcome Time Twister to the portfolio. Here's some before and afters.
So we have a brand new roller coaster in the portfolio. Welcome aboard Time Twister. And uh, this is it. This is the, the finished piece. So the main bulk of the work has happened around the, the plaza area in front of the station and itself. And the actual coaster has been torn down and it's been started again. So uh, this is what this is what we've done. Let's do a let's do a tour. So um, the main plaza area is that it's burger. Um, outlet redone, restripped out, and everything. I haven't done any more detail on detailing on this. Um, it's just there is a, a facsimile of a burger restaurant. Like I said before, it's not playable. Um, I've also done the photos. So just like all of the other relapse I've done, I've I've kept it the same sort of feeling, the same sort of setup um, with the screens and the people and it's just some clutter on the back. Uh, but the, the photos are in a different place. And this time I've added the the inverted commas ride logo as well just so that you know that that's what it is um, and so you come down from the exit here um, and then you come into uh, come into the right photo area I decided to ditch the brick in the plaza area for the firehouse um, again just because it gives a, a sort of like a level clean surface um, you haven't got to try and line up with the angle of the bricks and stuff you can just get on with having this as it is um, but the queue line itself still remains the brick. I sort of liked how that how that turned out. Did quite a lot of work in the station then, so we did a full a full station walkthrough. But um, it's had a lot of its facilities added, just loads of signage, um, the baggage hold areas. We were talking about how the uh, how the ride ops and everything would be working in this area. So I've just put those in to represent where they would be um, in this instance. And then we did a load of work to the maintenance area as well. Uh, so we've now got an actual maintenance shed uh, with some clutter that's around it um, and all of our appropriate signage and fences and, and, and everything that's going along here uh, we've got a van that's waiting for us and I've just touched up the plant work and everything along here just to tidy up slightly just to sort of make it a little bit, little bit cleaner along here added all of the signage um, and now our final turn is looking pretty lovely pretty nice um, I like actually how these firehouse window sills play with the uh, the topiary fence or the topiary hedge that we've got here. It's quite nice. Uh, I quite like how that how that effect is, especially as they as it narrows. So it's like uh, almost like the brickwork comes up to the level of the hedges. So I quite like that sightline. Uh, yeah. So this is completely stolen from um, Insane Speed in Taiwan, and uh, I just yeah I like how it, I like how it looks. It's very sort of like late 90s when everything was those curved roofs and everything was a bit like chic wasn't it um and i've chosen as well by the way the, the most garish color scheme that i possibly could like i wanted it to be this pink and blue um, i like the colors pink and blue anyway you've probably seen it in previous works that, that i've done but this had to feel like it was garish it had to feel like it was a late 90s thing um Especially with the B and M flawless, you know, like Hair Razor, for example, is that bright yellow, and Insane Speed is the red and yellow, and um, yeah, it's it's just that it's just that colour scheme, isn't it? I've just added some lockers here as well. I don't know whether we would actually have a dedicated locker building somewhere. I, I don't know if this would be enough, but it just gives you that facility then to head towards the right, decide to put your stuff in a locker before joining the queue and then coming back to get it. But I think in reality, you'd probably have a locker building away somewhere. Um, but this just gives you like that, that last chance. And I've just added the, the usual signage at the beginning as well at the, at the queue entrance, just to say, here's your height limit, here's your safety restrictions, the same safety restrictions that we saw on the, um, on the station wall. And then just your games and everything here. I didn't want to do anything, anything more with this. Didn't think there'd be any more than vending machines here anyway. As we said in the previous update, they wouldn't spend too much money here. It's just throw a few machines in just to make a bit of money from the area. You've got the burger restaurant, as I said. I've done absolutely no detailing inside. It's not playable, so there was no point wasting loads and loads of time making this ridiculously real. Um, but it just looks it looks nice on the sideline. It fits quite nicely now. Whereas before it felt a bit plonked. Now it's, it's quite nice. It fits, it fits there. Um, and then, like I say, we come around to the ride photos from here. You've got the uh, ride logo. You can see the lift hill. You can still see the, the burger out there. You can see all the rides that are, that are behind it. It's turned out quite turned out quite nicely. And uh, the maintenance area from this side now quite nicely sits on the hill. Um, and so I think that's pretty much as, as far out as you could possibly go. This would all be retaining walls and everything that would be that would be holding this in. Um, I don't think the park would make too much of an effort to try and hide this access. Um, it's pretty obvious what it is. And I mean, if you look at 
some reference images of other coasters there are some pretty obvious maintenance areas that are just impossible to hide so i think in this in this instance it's just good to embrace embrace this i don't think you'd put any kind of hedges or anything up to try and screen it and mask it and then coming down this way um i've just added in the foliage i've copied this from coral wonderland it works well there it works well in other uh, parks and relapse that I've done so I just thought it would be nice just to continue that theme and um, just gives that that plant variation doesn't it um, added in the logos along all of the the covers the path covers added in the fence signage all along uh, all along the ride so I've just finished it all off and I've used the same consistent compliance every eight meters certain height etc etc um, the coaster itself has been completely reprofiled as we know um, and so we've now got our heart line rolling on everything that we that we can possibly add it to um, and I've also just added in a couple of custom supports um, just because they were missing so there's two here um, that you needed some some kind of support uh, I've added two on the corkscrews here and I've also added some where did I put it over here I think um, just on this on this bend and then I've also reduced the number of supports as well because it uses the four meter method you end up with more supports than you actually need so I've just reduced the number of supports that are all, all along here um, looking at pictures of like the SeaWorld b and um, that's a very concrete pad style area ride area um, but because this is sitting on the side of a hill I thought it would be quite nice to actually just keep it quite landscaped so I didn't want to put too much effort into concreting this out um, it feels like they would have built it onto the onto the hill and so all I've done here is I've just touched up this um, this ride area uh, just with some concrete and just retaining wall and everything because we put this in just to show you what that cutout would look like but everything else is all above ground and then I've just also changed the terrain along here as well created some hills um, painted the the bits where the grass would be worn out and where the train keeps riding over it and it's maybe not growing so well underneath uh, so I've just done all of that just to give it that realism and again I'm, I'm limited to what terrain painting I've got in this scenario so I don't have things like tarmac I don't have the leaves I don't have the stuff I would normally use to sort of give up the ground a bit of mulch I've got two grass textures and I've got some sand and rock and that's all I'm working with so I've just lightly dusted those sand textures um, that I've got here just to give the element of it being worn away and uh, I didn't touch anything here I just kept this really simple um, I just put the fence by the way uh, just where the roller coaster comes quite close to the ground I don't think you'd even need a fence yeah, you would actually it sort of comes a little bit too close to the ground it's questionable as to whether you'd put a fence there um, because you, your person height the person can still walk quite comfortably underneath it without interacting with the ride they couldn't reach up and touch it but no I've just put the fence there anyway but I only bought it out as far as was definitely needed I didn't want to bring the, the fence out and bring it all, all along here and like I say if I were to do a bigger project I'd need to reel up all of this area as well just to make it all fit in this shop at the top would need some work and I didn't do any work to the uh, screaming swing I just added the front fence and that was it because the, the focus was here wasn't it so anyway that's uh that's us reeling up a B&M uh, in a previous Alpha Park. I hope you've enjoyed this one. Um, more so, I hope that you've enjoyed the talking through of real life theory behind operating rides. Um, I think that's that's something that a lot of people don't really know how the rides are working. And once you once you understand how those rides are working, you can then start threading that through how you're building because you know straight away that you need space for your maintenance area and that maintenance area needs to be a certain size and that you're, you'd have a certain number of staff on the station platform and what those staff actually do and um, the kind of signage that you need and everything so once you start to piece all of that together the realism happens up automatically it just happens naturally so anyway, that's it for this episode. If you do want to uh, leave something for me to reel up, then all of that detail is in the description. Uh, feel free to uh, leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your time. If you do like what you see, then leave a like, leave a comment, have a, su have a subscribe, um, ring the bell. You know, all of the cliches that happen with, with YouTube videos. Absolutely love talking to you guys anyway. So thank you so much for, for your time. And I will see you soon. Keep yourself safe. Bye-bye.